Committee report. June 11th, 2020, Committee on State Veterans and Military Affairs, after consideration of merits, committee is following. House Bill 1422, be referred favorably to Committee on Appropriations. June 11, 2020, Committee on State Veterans and Military Affairs, after consideration of merits, committee is following. House Bill 1332, be amended as follows, as so amended, be referred to Committee on Appropriations with a favorable recommendation. June 11, 2020, Committee on State Veterans and Military Affairs, after consideration of merits, committee is following. House Bill 1113, be referred to Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation, with a recommendation that be placed on the consent calendar. June 11, 2020, Committee on Finance, after consideration of merits, committee is following. House Bill 1421, be referred to Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation. June 11, 2020, Committee on Finance, after consideration of merits, committee is following. House Bill 1197, be referred favorably to Committee on Appropriations. Message from the Reviser. We herewith transmit without comment as amended, House Bill 1420. Introduction of bills. House Bill 1420 by Representative Soroto and Gray and Senators Moreno and Hanson concerning the adjustment of certain state tax expenditures in order to allocate additional revenues to the State Education Fund and in connection there with making an appropriation. Finance. Conference committees to report. First report on first committee on House Bill 1384. This report adopts the gross bills of the President of the Senate. Speaker, House of Representatives, your first conference committee appointed on House Bill 1384 concerning the delay of department implementation of high fidelity wraparound services for eligible at risk children unless money is appropriate for the services in connection with reducing appropriations has met and reports that it is agreed upon the following that the Senate recede from its amendments made to the bill and the green gross bill be adopted without change, respectfully submitted. House Committee, Representative Escar, McCleskey, and Ransom, Senate Committee, Senators Moreno, Zenzinger, and Rankin. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate recess until 4 p.m. today. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. And the Senate will stand in recess until 1,600 hours today.
Members, we'll be starting about 15 minutes. We're still waiting for some committee reports.
Representative McCain will be. Sergeants, please escort him out and find the representative. Two dollars. The good representative can never sit in the good senator from Senate District 1's chair. Mr. Majority Leader. You want to do a call? Thank you, Mr. President. I move a call of the Senate. A call of the Senate has been moved and properly sustained. Will the sergeants please close the doors, allow no senators to leave, but allow the representative to leave and return all senators who are absent to the chamber? Mr. Carpenter, please call the roll. Senators Bridges, Cook, Corum, Crowder, Danielson, Donovan, Finberg, Fields. Foot, Gardner, <coughs> Janal, Gonzalez, Hansen, Hill, Heisey, Holbert, Lee, Here. Lundeen, Marble, Moreno, Pedersen, Priola, Rankin, Rodriguez, Scott, Here. Smallwood, Sonnenberg, Story, Tate, Todd, Williams. Present. Winter. Woodward. Zinzinger. Cook. Corum. Gardner.
Holbert. Has anyone texted him? Here. I like the boys from the mom. Mom? Your voice has changed. <laughs> Hill. No, I think we're gonna try doing it again. I know. I was just saying. I told them everything. No, I knew I get crazy. Like, oh, man. Tate. Rankin. Hanson. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the call be raised. You have heard the motion. The motion is to raise the call. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have and the call is raised. <laughs> Mr. Carpenter, please excuse Senators Marble and Moreno. Committee reports. June 11th, 2020, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration of Mary's Committee on Following House Bill 1197, be referred to Committee to Hold. The February recommendation, June 11th, 2020, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration of Mary's Committee on Following House Bill 1332, be referred to Committee to Hold. The February recommendation, June 11th. 2020 Committee on Appropriations after consideration of Marriage Committee the following House Bill 1406 be amended as follows as so amended be referred to Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation June 11, 2020 Committee on Appropriations after consideration of Marriage Committee the following House Bill 1419 be referred to Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation June 11, 2020 Committee on Appropriations after consideration of Marriage Committee the following House Bill 1422 be referred to Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation recommendation placed on the consent calendar June 11, 2020 Committee on Appropriations after consideration of Marriage Committee the following House Bill 1423 be referred to Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation Mr. Carpenter, please add Senator Moreno to the roll call. And Senator, yeah. and Senator Marble. Mr. Majority Leader. What, third? Third reading of bills, final third reading, final passage of bills. Mr. Carpenter, please read the title of House Bill 1416. House Bill 1416 by Representatives Gardner and Neville and Senators Finberg and Holbert concerning the modification of fiscal information prepared by Legislative Council staff related to an initiated measure and in connection with reducing an appropriation. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move House Bill 1416 and think it's perfect just the way it is and <laughs> definitely will not need any third reading amendments. Is there any discussion? Senator Sonberg. Senator Sonnenberg. Amendment on desk, there is amendment on the desk. Mr. Mr. Carpenter, please read Amendment L003. Amendment L003, House Bill 1460, Senator Sonnenberg. Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, actually, you know what? I have you to move? ask permission, don't I? But the good Senator. Please share with the body why we should allow you the opportunity to get permission to offer a third reading amendment. Mr. President, I humbly come before you today <laughs> to ask your help in f just making a couple additions to this perfect bill. And this perfect bill, actually, we had talked about removing the ability for 
some information to get the voters. This is a compromise that says we don't have to do it on all the ballot initiatives, but the initiatives that go to the petition process will get that information and we'll use the best information we have available to put that on the petition. It's actually a very good compromise and I would urge you to support the compromise. Uh, ask for your permission to offer L003 when that time is appropriate. The question before the body is to allow the good senator from Sterling Permission to offer an amendment on third reading. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have and permission is granted. <laughs> Senator Sonberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I move L003 for the reasons I explained earlier. Thank you, sir. Mr. Minority Leader. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I do ask your support for L003. My first session here in the Senate was 2015, and near the end of that session, Senator, the Senator from Sterling and our good friend, form, former Senator Lois Court, sponsored House Bill 1057. They worked hard on that bill. House Bill 1416 affects that bill. I didn't realize that until yesterday. Senator, the Senator from Sterling uh, started looking at it and asking questions. Does, does the bill impact negatively what he and Senator Court had worked so hard to achieve? I wasn't sure of the answer of that, but it came back as yes. And with L003, we can save money and provide some relief to legislative council, which is where the request for the bill came from to the executive committee. With L003, the good senator from Sterling and Senator Court, their hard work, a good portion of it, is still perceived, or, uh, 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 assured, continues. Excuse me. With L003, Legislative Council also gets part of what they were asking for. I'm grateful for the majority leader to be open to uh, continue the bill. There's been some discussion about whether the bill should continue. With this amendment, it can. And Legislative Council can have some relief, but it doesn't undermine the great work that my friend from Sterling and my friend from Denver achieved in 2015. I ask your I vote for L003. Is there further discussion? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I uh, agree with what's been said. I want to thank the um, good Senator from Sterling uh, for doing, doing this work uh, over the last couple of hours and getting this to a place um, where it's a, a friendly amendment um, to the sponsors uh, as well as acceptable for um, our staff that work so hard. And, want to make sure they, they get what they need to continue to do the work they do. Having no further discussion before the body, the motion is the adoption of Amendment L003 to House Bill 1416. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent, and zero excuse, Amendment L003 is adopted. The bill. The motion before the body is the passage of House Bill 1416 on third reading. Final passage. Are there any no votes? With 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent, and zero excuse, House Bill 1416 is passed. Co sponsors Senators Cook, Quorum, Crowder, Todd, Priola, Sonnenberg, Gardner, Pedersen, Tate, Lee, Scott.
Please add Senator Bridges as a co-sponsor. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, uh, you should have a calendar uh, on your desks. We'll be pulling up a, um, a special order second reading of bills consent calendar as well as then a special order second reading of bills separately. Um, and Mr. President, uh, I move that the Senate take up House Bill 1403, House Bill 1113, House Bill 1422 uh, on special order second reading of bills consent calendar at the hour of 5.40 p.m. The motion is for the Senate to take up special order second reading of bills consent calendar. The first three bills. Oh, 540. At the hour of 17.40. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Well, the Senate will take up special order secondary bills consent calendar, which would consist of 1413, House Bill 1413, House Bill 1113, and House Bill 1422 at the hour of 1740. At the hour of 1740. Special order secondary bills consent calendar. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for special orders, second reading of bills, consent calendar. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have and the motion is adopted. The Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders, second reading of bills, and Senator Zenzinger will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the coat rule is relaxed. Will the clerk please read the titles to all of the bills on general orders, excuse me, special orders, second reading of bills, consent calendars. House Bill 1403 by Representatives Robert Scatlin, Senators Donovan and Sonnenberg, concerning the funding of Colorado Water Conservation Board projects in connection therewith, making an appropriation, House Bill 1113. For represents the tone of Van Winkle and Senators Bridges and Lundin concerning mental health educational resources in connection there with making enhancements in the Safe to Tell program, House Bill 1422 by representatives Escar and Cutter and Senator Story and Zenzinger concerning the creation of the Food Pantry Assistance Grant program in connection there with authorizing an allocation of money the state receives from the Federal Coronavirus Relief Fund. Majority Leader Fenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move for the passage of all the bills on the special order, secondary and bills consent calendar, including House Bill... 1403 and the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee Report, House Bill 1113 and House Bill 1422. Is there any discussion on any of the committee reports? So the motion before the body is the adoption of the report to 1403. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the report is adopted. Is there any discussion on any of the bills on the consent calendar? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of all the bills on special orders, second reading of bills, consent calendar. All of those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the bills are adopted. <laughs> Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is for the committee to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted and the committee will rise and report. The Senate will come to order. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, 
you, Mr. President. The committee has had a number of bills under consideration. Will the clerk please read the report? Mr. President, your committee holds the report setting a serious problem. Test bills being segregated. The government makes one recommendation to run House Bill 1403 as House Bill 1113. House Bill 1422 passed. Segregated. Revised. Please count up for the ring of bond passage. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the adoption of the report. The motion before the body is the adoption of the committee of the whole report. Are there any no votes? With 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent, and zero excuse, the committee of the whole report is adopted. But I'm so House Bill 1403 as amended, House Bill 1113, House Bill 1422 passed on second reading, order revised and placed on the calendar for third reading, final passage. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members will pull up the other part of your calendar. Uh, I move that the Senate take up uh, House Bill 1415, House Bill 1213, House Bill 1421, House Bill 1410, House Bill 1197, House Bill 1332, House Bill 1406, House Bill 1419, and House Bill 1423 on special order second reading of bills at the hour of 5.45 p.m. The motion is that the Senate take up on special order second reading of bills the following bills. House Bill 1415, House Bill 1213, House Bill 1421, House Bill 1410, House Bill 1197, House Bill 1332, House Bill 1406, House Bill 1419, and House Bill 1423 on special orders at the hour of 1745. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed no. The ayes have it and that motion is adopted. Special order, second reading bills. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special order, second reading of bills. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted, and the Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special order, second reading of bills. And Senator Zenzinger will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the coat rule is relaxed. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1415. House Bill 1415 by Representatives Harrod and Sullivan, Senators Pedersen and Rodriguez concerning workers' rights in the workplace for conduct related to a principal's actions during public health emergency and in connection with making an appropriation. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Ma Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1415 and the, let's see, the Finance Committee Report to the Finance Committee report. Thank you, Madam Chair. We had multiple amendments, uh, some concerns that have been raised through uh, stakeholders along the way. It makes this bill much better. I ask for your support. Is there any discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the committee report is adopted to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this pandemic has raised uh, multiple concerns for people who are, uh, who are put in situations at work where they feel unsafe. Uh, unfortunately, some of our frontline workers included. I'm doing outreach across my district to see what we can do to help uh, people navigate uh, what's going on and get them the, the resources and support that they need. I spoke to numerous nurses who unfortunately felt fearful to speak about the conditions at work at the hospitals um, with the lack of PPE and that they were worried that they were going to get fired. We've heard these stories in the news and we need to make sure that we're protecting workers that as a and start going back into the workforce that they are able to have a conversation if they don't feel safe at work because they aren't following guidelines. It doesn't enforce guidelines. It doesn't actually, it's not putting in statute that they have to uh, comply with any of the guidelines. Uh, we heard a lot of testimony about that. That's not what this bill does. But what it does say is that if a worker brings up that they feel unsafe, that they're able to have that conversation. 
That's really important for us in Colorado so that we can have these conversations in our workplace so that we are continuing to improve the conditions for people during this public health crisis. Um, it also says that if somebody brings this up and is retaliated against, that then you would have, and unfortunately if you're retaliated against or, or fired, that you could go through a process to have those wrongs righted. Uh, we put multiple pieces in here to make sure that it's, you know, that it mitigates uh, any lawsuits that are, that are unnecessary, um, that they exhaust all of the remedies first before moving forward uh, if they pursue a lawsuit. And this only is related to a public health emergency. So this is, this is a very narrow bill in the, uh, for the very limited times that we're going to experience this in our lifetime, that we are protecting workers to ensure that they have that they can bring their own PPE if it exceeds the standards, as long as it doesn't impede their ability to do their job, and that they can have the conversations if they feel like they aren't safe at work. And so I uh, really appreciate everybody's feedback along the way. Uh, we've made this bill much better. And uh, you know, we, we continue to listen. I know this has been a fast process, um, but, th but I really appreciate where this bill is and all the stakeholder work that went on um, in the months leading up to this. So, uh, members, I ask for your support. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I uh, second that support. This is just a simple bill allowing people to have some protections in the workplace if they don't feel safe to make a complaint without any retaliatory remarks or anybody getting threatened to lose their job. So, I ask for your support. And I vote. Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, to the bill sponsors, I apologize. We're moving a little fast. Here's, here's an amendment for you, and I'll get to it at some point. I apologize I didn't get that to you sooner. We've been moving quickly here. So um, trying to want to establish specifically the, the need, and um, we're coming through this season of tumult where things have been upended in, in, in our lives in so many ways. And um, we heard some testimony that uh, individuals uh, really felt that th their employers were behaving in kind of a command and control sort of way and they didn't feel as if their voice was being heard back up into the conversation and and I think all of us I think that resonates quite frankly with all of us I mean consider the circumstance we've been in the people of Colorado have been in where we've been in this season of crisis and we were told by a single point the governor of Colorado basically said, everybody stay home. Don't even come out of your house because it's not safe. And so I think that, that concern of, of being told from the top down what to do, how to behave, what's going to happen, is that's something that resonates with all of us. But trying to get at the, the real challenge, the real need, the real understanding of what the problem is, and at the same time not create a cottage industry for lawsuits, which I think very likely is a, an unintended but, but highly likely outcome of this bill. Um, I, I r raised the issue with, we discussed in committee, and I now um, have an amendment to, to address that matter and would like to speak to that at the appropriate moment. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L012? Amendment L012, that's before. Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move L012 to House Bill 1415. To the amendment. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So what this bill, or this amendment to the bill simply says is, understand, we've been in this season of tumult where there was a lot going on, we didn't understand what was going on necessarily. Everyone, from the governor to um, managers of divisions and departments in businesses, and they were all doing the best they could, and, and it was difficult. And this amendment simply says that, that should this bill pass, should it move forward, it becomes effective going forward. It doesn't reach back into that season of tumult that we've just come through um, for the purpose of just creating more 
um, angst and challenge with lawsuits that might come out of what we've come through, where we were all trying to come together. We were all doing the best we could. This simply says, this amendment simply says, get it, understand it, um, let's just make sure that it's going forward and not reaching back into um, crises and information that might, quite frankly, be fodder for um, unnecessary pursuit of legal action. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a friendly amendment, and I ask for your support. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of Amendment L012. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Is there any further discussion? Senator Smallwood. Um, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just have a question to the, to the bill sponsors. Wanted to know if we could go into a little bit of detail about um, what, is the, what is the root cause for the need of the bill? Because as I read it, we're really talking about two things. One that says that the principal, whether that's a public employer or private employer, is not supposed to discriminate or take any adverse actions, retaliate. If you've got a worker who is looking at their work environment and they see, they see obvious uh, violations relative to what we've been told by the federal government, the state, their local health department. So um, I, I guess I, I have not personally heard of that happening so I'm, I'm i'm assuming that the genesis of the bill is that this did happen it happened to somebody somebody reached out saying um the work environment that i was in was unsafe meaning i was supposed to uh have plexiglass up and there was no plexiglass i was supposed to have a mask and gloves but when i showed up for work, there was no mask or gloves or something along those lines. So um, if you could spend just a minute going through what really did happen, where did it happen, and was that person then discriminated against, or those people, I should say, discriminated against, adverse action was taken against them, or they were retaliated against, and exactly what those... Um, workplace health and safety practices were that they were operating within um, at the time that happened. I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Winter. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, have had calls from at least half a dozen and that I might be, that estimate might be low from first responders that have been working since the coronavirus outbreak with stories of their workplace rationing PPE. Whereas before the coronavirus outbreak, they changed a mask before every patient. They changed gloves before every patient. And when they asked their employer to adhere to safety standards they were told you can quit, and they did. We actually lost doctors and nurses during this time because when they raised safety standards, they were told to quit, so they did. At a time where we were recruiting first responders because we needed more, they were leaving. There were first responders working in grocery stores that we're told that we aren't providing the PPE and there is no PPE around to be bought. So this has happened and people have actually left their jobs and careers and are moving out of state. So we've had other bills where we've talked about people that will leave Colorado because maybe we did X or maybe we did Y or maybe we did Z and we're gonna actually drive people out of Colorado. I have a neighbor that is moving out of state because he didn't feel like he had the protection as a first responder or the ability to lodge a complaint. That's why we need this bill. 
This has been an actual constituent call that I've dealt with numerous times. When we were in quarantine, we had many updates from the governor's office on the supplies of PPE, because admittedly, in the beginning, we didn't have enough. So maybe some rationing was warranted. But once we started getting updates from the governor's office that we had increased the supply chain, there was enough PPE, there was PPE around and the first responders should no longer be worried and I was still getting calls. And I would get on the call with the governor's office and say, you're telling me they have PPE but their employers still aren't giving it to them. We fixed the supply chain. We did our job. We got shipments in from all over the world. And they're still being given one mask a day. And they're being told, don't complain. We can replace you. You can leave. So yes, this has happened. And that's why this bill is so necessary. Senator Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the Senator um, from Douglas County. There you go. Douglas County. Thank you for the question. Sorry, Senator um, I was like, I, I drew a blank, I'm sorry. I, I do appreciate the question. Um, we heard this bill in committee, and I have to say that um, we had 31 individual letters from people who worked on the um, who worked on the front lines and who were essential who are essential workers who are afraid to speak out and I just want to I won't read the entire statement but I will speak um, and, and quote a little bit from one of the letters that we did receive um, in, in the committee of reference that hopefully responds to the question about the need for the bill. This is from a worker who uh, is an employee of the JBS U USA meatpacking facility in Greeley, Colorado, where they, had ha they have had eight COVID-19 related deaths since March. After the facility reopened, this employee felt very concerned with the lack of precautions. There's no social distancing. There's now masks. People are standing right next to each other when they work, bumping elbows. And, and here's where I'll quote. I feel strongly that the public and the media have a right to know about what is happening at the facility and know the whole story. So I've appeared on the radio and news segments speaking out. Just last week, I went onto TV to speak out and after the facility um, staged the floor and made it look like there are more social distancing protocols in place for a news show. The public and the employees at JBS deserve to know the truth and I should be able to speak out on public health and safety concerns. Recently, the safety department told me that if I keep going on the news, they will not fire me, but they will make my life hell. I asked if that was a threat and they said, no, it's just what's gonna happen and it has. The day after this conversation, they moved me to a different, not great job in the facility. I continue to be moved to different stations where I do not know how to perform the task because I have not been trained to work at that station. This results in me not producing as much and getting yelled at. It's gotten so bad that I have called out of work a few days because I don't want to put myself through that anymore. I am worried that my actions will result in my termination at the facility. I am worried that the retaliation will continue in other forms of punishment if I continue to work there. House Bill 20-1450 is so important for workers like myself. The passage of this bill would protect me from the retaliation I am facing at work and make sure that I and my colleagues can continue to speak out to protect our health and safety. And so that's just one of the um, 31 letters that our committee received. I too, um, similar to the Senator from Westminster, received calls from, uh, from other um, frontline workers in my district. Um, there is a bakery um, uh, in my district uh, that bakes bread.
for many of the grocery stores here in the metro area, they had a COVID outbreak. They reached out for PPE. They were told, well, if you don't feel, um, if you don't feel like you might be sick, you should stay home and stop coming to work. But we're, we have things, to, we have work to do here. Um, that is the, we are in the middle of a pandemic at the moment. We all have the, the obligation to ensure that our businesses are doing right by our workers so that our workers can do right by their businesses and do right for our community. And that is why, um, hopefully, um, uh, to the good senator from Douglas County, hopefully that um, resolves the rationale and the need for the bill. Thank you. Senator Smallwood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the comments from the senator from Westminster and the senator from Denver. And I guess I, I guess I see what we're trying to do here, but what I don't see is practically speaking what we would have done. So here's my example. This is where I may need a little more help from you. First of all, I totally get it. If you go to work someplace and they are blatantly violating the rules, right? The local health department says, here's what we want. We want 50% capacity in the office and we want you to wear masks and we want social distancing in the office. And the public health department comes out with all these rules and you show up for work and guess what? The boss says, look, I don't care about any of that stuff that public health was talking about. You get yourself to work, take off that mask. I don't want any customers to come in and see you with that mask on. And then she says, and we, we don't want gloves. That's gonna tarnish the image of the organization. And, and no, you're gonna sit right in that cubicle next to somebody. And if you don't do that, you're gonna get fired. Or like you said, we're gonna make your life heck. If that's the situation that we're talking about, I'm all on board. Wish you would have asked me to be a prime sponsor. But what I'm concerned about is that practically speaking, that's not what I see. Practically speaking, this is what I'm worried about. You're operating an ICU or an emergency room. And just like what we saw very recently, we run out of PPE. There is none. Or we're told there is none, to the senator from Westminster's point, whether we had it or not. But if you're the employer and you're told there is no PPE, you've got people streaming into an ICU or an emergency room and you've got a worker that says, look, I'm, I'm not gonna rewear this mask. Patient's just, sorry, patient's gonna have to suffer because I'm, I'm not coming into work having to rewear these masks and these gloves. And all of their coworkers say that also. Practically speaking, colleagues, what? We're, we're going to grind an ER to a halt? We're going to grind an ICU to a halt? And we're going to have no workers there because we're, we have to let them all go. Otherwise, we're going to have to pay them all back pay anyway. This is where you're losing me a little bit. Like I said, I really like picking off really bad people in this. But if we're in a situation where an employer has no choice and we're in a situation as critical as saving patient lives, and that's just one example, that's just what I happen to think of between that desk and this well, I'm sure there are several others, and, and the government has said you are an essential worker, we need you, no, and, and I don't know what all the examples might be. I picked out healthcare. Maybe it's, I heard something about food production, right? Where the, the government said, no, you're essential. We need to have, we need to feed the citizens of the state of Colorado and or the United States. I just, I just don't know what an, what an employer is supposed to do. If they can't tell somebody, we, we need to have you here to see patients. And I'm sorry that you have to rewear a mask, but we don't have any other masks. And what if, what if it's the next pandemic that happens or a spike that happens and that really happens? What, what are we supposed to do? What in the bill addresses what we're going to do for essential operations where an employer 
doesn't have a choice, whether they're in health care or somebody else, that's essential. If you could point me to that part in the bill, that would help. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for that question. Actually, this bill is exactly the first situation that you described. This is where this would come into play, where you show up to work and they're saying, get your mask off. That's not allowed here. We don't believe in this. You're going to sit next to the person in the cubicle. We don't care about trying to make it, uh, you know, enough distance apart. And then the person says, I don't feel safe. I'm, I'm worried for my life during this once in a century public health crisis, this pandemic. I am worried about my family at, at home and what I might be bringing home. And, or I have a risk. I, I actually am vulnerable. I, I want to wear a mask. That's what we're talking about here. But then they can't say, well, then you're fired. So this is a very narrow circumstance. When we're talking about businesses who are doing the best that they can, who are desperate for PPE, and we're trying to do everything that they could to protect their employees, but they, they didn't have the materials. That's what so many people, that's what we were faced with across Colorado. So if somebody says, I don't feel safe here, and you say, I understand we're, we're doing the best that we can, and they're allowed to have that conversation, that is, this bill has nothing to do with that. The example of the emergency room, uh, you're not going to say the case in which it would be, um, this bill would apply is if you spoke out and then you were fired because you said, I don't feel safe with these practices. Instead, it's, I know we're, we're reusing these masks right now, but we have PPE coming in. It's being able to have those conversations about what we're able to do to address safety during these times. So um, you described perfectly what this bill is in that first situation. And it's, it's very narrow in this rare situation that when people are getting back to work, they're doing so safely. Senator Smallwood. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the answers from the uh, good senator from Lakewood, but sadly it didn't really address my actual question, which is, please help me understand how the employer at the ICU or the emergency room is not going to be held liable under this. Because as I read page three of the re-engrossed bill, a principal, which would mean the operator of an emergency room or an ICU, unless there's an exception in here that I haven't seen yet. Principal shall not discriminate, good, they shouldn't, take adverse action. I don't know about you, but if my boss told me that if you're not going to be here at work, you need to go home and you're not gonna get paid. I would call that adverse action. I have to go home and not get paid. So if my complaint in this ICU is, I'm not going to wear, re-wear a mask. I'm not going to re-wear this gown. And, and, and I don't know that that's the situation. Hypothetically, though, it could be. And I am sent home, and I don't get pay for that, according to this bill as I read it, page three, Line 19, as an employer, I am taking adverse action against an employee, and I am now not only a, a lawbreaker, but there's consequences for me. So what I ask, again, if my colleagues could clarify, you're the one running the ICU, you're the one running the emergency room, there is no PPE. Colleagues, what do we do in that situation? Because we might be in that situation very soon. Senator Pedersen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So once again, um, so we're looking at page three that we were just discussing. A principal shall not discriminate, take adverse action, or retaliate against any worker who, in good faith, raises any reasonable concern about workplace violations of government health or safety rules or about an otherwise significant workplace threat to health or safety related to a public health emergency. So this is 
this does lay out exactly, this does answer your question because it's saying, can you raise concerns without being fired? Are you able to speak out without being fired? That is what we're talking about here. We're not saying, if you're saying that you're not going to do the job, now we have a unemployment insurance bill that uh, is going through, that if somebody does feel like they can't go to their job because it's unsafe, where there's a process where they could be covered for actually, you know, having unemployment insurance and not continuing to go to work, that's not this bill. This is, this is not about getting in the way of your job. This is specifically just saying that you are able to discuss your safety concerns at work without being retaliated against. So, you know, the reason why this building, you probably haven't heard that much about this bill is because this is very narrow in scope. There are a lot of uh, steps here to ensure that all remedies are utilized before somebody would actually take the action to sue. Um, and so that is what we are talking about here, is simply being able to raise concerns in your workplace and most importantly, well, I would say both are very important, but they are able to show up if your work doesn't have PPE, which many, especially early on, struggled, that you can actually bring your own mask if that, if that is going to, if you have access to that. You could actually bring your own PPE to work if it doesn't get in the way of your job and if it doesn't exceed, or if it doesn't reduce the standard. So we had a, a concern raised with Children's Hospital, for example, because they have a very high standard for their PPE, of course, uh, in, in a hospital setting. So you would not be allowed to bring your own PPE in that situation because they're going to have a higher standard for what is actually given to you. So that's what we're talking about here. Is there any further discussion? Senator Heisey. Senator Smallwood. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I appreciate the comments from the Senator from Lakewood. It feels like we're getting into a little bit of a circular conversation here because I'm, I'm trying to phrase my question as simplistically as I can because all I'm concerned about right this second is about emergency rooms and ICUs. So what I, all, all I'd really like to hear is if you're operating an ICU or an emergency room and a worker is not going to work because of health concerns, how is sending that worker home and not paying them not an adverse event? And what's the phrase that we use on page three? How is that not considered adverse action? Because I will tell you, if I got sent home for my job and didn't get a paycheck, I would very much call that an adverse action. So you are the one running the ICU or the emergency room. You're in this situation. How is it addressed? And if it's not addressed, would you consider an amendment that carves out emergency rooms and ICUs to address my question? Thank you. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like, I thank the, the specific question that my uh, colleague asked. I'm interested to know if he was in that ICU room as a patient during this pandemic for some kind of emergency car accident, would he want to know if the nurses and the people in there were using day old PPE equipment? Um, because last year we went through this on the peer review where we get into the nuances of having to deal with the nuance of all that information being discussed through the, for the accountability. And I'm just interested in his answer if he'd want to know if that was being, if he had that kind of procedure. Senator Pedersen. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, what you're referring to, the adverse action is, you're really trying to address causation and what the adverse action is. And the adverse action, if you're sending somebody home because you're trying to protect them because they raise concerns, is different than sending them home and firing them because they raise concerns. So we are not uh, saying that this is not going to say that anyone can say, I'm not working anymore because we don't have, have these things that I don't feel comfortable with. They're able to say, I'm concerned about this for my, my health. Uh, they could go through the process of actually getting unemployment insurance 
if there was a reason in which they would, were unable to go to work. That's in another bill. Um, but what this does is it ensures that they're actually able to have that conversation to bring their own PPE. So I don't, I feel like we are going, I also agree, uh, I feel like we are having a circular conversation here. Um, this is about the adverse action, which is yes, you can't say I'm firing you and sending you home without pay because you raise those, those concerns. You could say if you want to go home because you feel unsafe, um, that's much different. So I, I don't know how else to answer it. Senator Smallwood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the, to the Senator. I guess you can answer it by just responding whether or not you'd be open to amendment that specifically address operators of emergency rooms, ICUs, hospitals, because in my opinion, this is where this is going to come up, and I would hate to end up in an ICU or an emergency room and find that there is nobody there to take care of me because we run out of PPE again. That's not the employer's fault, as I can see it. That's just the world. It's the world we live in in 2020. So if we'd be open to that, this is something that I could get behind. Is there any further discussion? Senator Heisey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Shifting gears somewhat, uh, no pun intended, uh, truck drivers. And being one of the three percent of uh, of the legislature that let me raise that up a bit. Being one of the three percent of the uh, the uh, legislature that actually is uh, legal to drive a, a truck, um, it struck me that uh, truck drivers are already covered under this type of thing, and the more layers of bureaucracy and rules you put on top of of any subject that this one and drivers in particular, the more you're guaranteed that, that you're not going to be in compliance when something goes wrong. So the way I understand it is a, a driver has special rules. If you'll recall back to the, uh, uh, to the handheld devices discussion a year ago, we're down here discussing whether the fine should be $100, $50, $300 for the third offense. They don't mess with it. If you're a commercial driver and you've got a handheld device in your hand, it's $2,500. So, so they take it to a higher extreme where, where that public safety is, is uh, at risk. So I believe that, that uh, this bill uh, just adds another layer of something that is already in place for the truck drivers. The sponsors, who I've been speaking with for a few days on this, are not quite sure that that is correct. We are seeking clarification and believe we should have it soon. So to that end, I have an amendment here that I will be friendly and not offer. However, I do reserve the right to uh, come back down and the sponsors have agreed that, that we, if we get that clarification, we will uh, decide then whether the amendment is applicable or not. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Well, Senator Pedersen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize, I was having a conversation with Saib and I'm sure that I uh, know your concerns well um, through having conversations throughout this. So I just wanna say that while we look for further information on whether or not um, some of these different uh, jobs are actually covered under, and industries are covered under federal law. Uh, happy to continue to look at that for third reading if it actually is a gap or if it would be duplicative. Um, so I appreciate you working with us and we're still looking at that. But as far as I know um, from the information that I've received and looked at so far, that only addresses the vehicle safety and it doesn't actually address the public health issue. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1415. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and 1415 is adopted.
Will the clerk please read the Title II, House Bill 1213. House Bill 1213 by Representatives Young and Pelton, Senators Rodriguez and Sonnenberg concerning the continuation of the Department of Agriculture's regulatory functions related to persons who work with agricultural products and in connection with them with recommendations contained in 2019 Census Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies concerning the Commodity Handler Act and the Farm Products Act. Do you have an amendment clarifying? Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1213 and ask for an I vote. This was a sunset. Oh, and the finance report. Is there any further discussion to the report? Uh, yeah, the report? we had a nice meeting in the committee. Everybody agreed. There was a lot of stakeholdering, and it was a very positive process is there any other discussion on the committee report senator sonnenberg thank you madam chair basically the committee report took out the section of the bill that asked for us to license any grain handler or commodity handler that did under two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year business essentially what they were doing was asking them to register charge them $25 and give a license. And we decided that it probably wasn't the best idea to just have them spend $25 to be put into a database. So we took that section out. Ask for your I vote on the committee report. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of the finance committee report. All of those in favor say aye. <laughs> those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1213 and ask for an I vote. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1213. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The aye has it and the bill is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1421. House Bill 1421 by Representative Robinson saying Senator Donovan Sonnenberg concerning delinquent interest payments for property tax payments. Senator Donovan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1241 on second reading. 1421. What did I say? 1241. But I think you meant 1421. Is that correct? Dyslexics unite. Uh, I move House Bill 1421. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body. Senator Sommerberg? No, okay. The motion before the body is the adoption of 1421. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1421 is adopted. Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1410 uh, lay over to the bottom of the Special Order Secondary Amendment Bill's calendar. Yeah. The motion before the body is to lay over 1410 to the bottom of the calendar. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1197. House Bill 1197 by Representative Snyder and Rich and Senator Bridges concerning the statewide communication system for referral to essential services in connection that we make an appropriation. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1197 and no committee report. There is none, so to the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's a great bill. Please vote yes. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1197. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and House Bill 1197 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1332? House Bill 1332 by Representatives Harrod and Jackson, Senator Fields, concerning prohibition on discrimination in housing based on source of income and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Yeah. 
There was a technical <laughs> amendment that Jennifer brought up from the court uh, that we should have put on the slot of the handlers. I forgot about it. Uh, do you have the amendment? I can't find it. 1332. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll go All right. Uh, so Senator Fields. Madam Chair, I move House Bill 1432 and the committee report. I think you mean 1332, is that correct? Members in the committee, we adopted Could you an please amendment. move 1332? Okay. Madam Chair, I move House Bill 18, 1432. 18? I think we are in year 2020. <laughs> Third, I move House Bill 1332. Great. To the committee report. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. In committee, we adopted an amendment that adds a new exception that says that the landlords that own five or few single family unit homes are not required to accept Section 8 vouchers. I ask for an aye vote on the committee report. And actually, could you move the committee report? I move the committee report. Great. Is there any discussion on the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee report? Seeing none, the motion is to adopt the committee report. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read the amendment L012? Amendment L012, House Bill 1332, by Senator John Allman, State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee Report, dated June 11, 2020, page 1, strike lines 4 through 11, substitute 1.7, outstanding in provisions of section Senator 1. Fields. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, Amendment L013. Uh, we are on Amendment L012, which I believe is Senator Janal's amendment. Uh, Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move Amendment L012. To the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Basically, this removes the language on advertising that the landlord does, if the landlord does not want to accept federal housing choice vouchers. Um, I feel that that's unnecessary and uh, that uh, the advertising shouldn't have to be done. So I ask for an I vote on Amendment L012. Is there any further discussion? Senator Fields. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And members, I ask for a, a no vote on this amendment. Um, we have over 42 different stakeholders that's been working on this piece of legislation for over three years. And advertising is a critical um, point in reference to trying to find housing. So if you don't put notice out there, then people don't know where to go to rent property. So members, I once again would ask that you a vote no on this amendment. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L012? Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of Amendment L012. All of those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The noes have it and the amendment is lost. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L013? Amendment L013. Senator Fields. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I move L013. To the amendment. Members, um, basically what this amendment does, um, it kind of corrects a, a mistake that we um, had on an amendment that we had in committee. We left out the word only. So when we left out only five or fewer single rental homes, it gave the impression that you could have 100 units. And that wasn't the intent and the spirit of the bill. We want to say only five or fewer homes would be exempt from um, accepting vouchers. So I asked for an I vote on L013.
Is there any further discussion? Senator Smallwood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, having read the prior amendment and now this amendment L013, wondered if the bill sponsor could uh, share with those who weren't in this committee what the difference between those two would be. Senator Fields. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Senator, if you look at L0, I think it was 8, and if you look at line 4, it says, if a landlord owns five or fewer, we added the word only on line 4. And then if you go down to line 5, it says there, starting on line five, no other rental units and provides notice in, so that's, that's part in there, but no other rental units. And then in the last line, on line 10, it says those five single family homes as acceptable sources of income does not have to accept the voucher. So once again, members, I urge for an I vote on L013. Is there any further discussion? Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just think um, I rise up against this because if you have five or less units, why should you have to advertise that you don't accept Section 8 housing? Um, it isn't necessary. Uh, it's going to hurt. Uh, mom and pop businesses don't have to, or shouldn't have to be able to advertise that they don't take Section 8. Maybe they do. So I ask for no vote. We need to wipe the mics one moment. All right. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of Amendment L013. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Well, that amendment is adopted. Okay, yeah. <laughs> to the bill? There is an amendment on the desk. The amendment was adopted. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read amendment L014? Amendment L014, also 1330, by Senator Janal. Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, L014 simply amends the reengrossed bill on page four from three units and substitutes five units. As for an I vote. Is there any discussion? Senator Fields. Members, I urge a no vote on this amendment L014. What it does right now, it, it's taking it to, um, to three instead of the five. So I urge a no vote. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L014? Three to five. I'm not changing it. It's five in the bill or it's three in the bill? It's five. Uh, so, Senator Janal. Uh, Senator Janal. Just for clarification, what this does is in the bill, it strikes three, the owner of three units and it changes it to five units, which is what was in the amendment, but it's not in the bill. I ask for an I vote. Senator Fields. Members, I still urge a no vote on this amendment. And um, at this point, um, I need to keep the bill intact in reference to the language that we've adopted in the amendment. So I urge a no vote on that amendment. Is there any further discussion? We will take a senatorial five. So.
Okay, great. And I'm gonna go. Danny McCarthy's texting me telling me to wait over. Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, House Bill 1332 lay over to the bottom of the special orders second reading of bills calendar. Um, one quick process question. We were in the middle of an amendment. Do we need to withdraw that amendment first before we can lay it over or take some sort of action? So I think, um, Senator Janal, we need to either vote or withdraw your amendment so that we can lay it over. Madam Chair, uh, I withdraw Amendment L014. The amendment has been withdrawn. Now, the majority leader has asked that we lay over the bill until the end of the calendar, is that correct? The motion before the body is to lay over House Bill 1332 as amended to the end of the bottom of, to the end of the bottom, to the end of the <laughs> second reading of Bill's special orders. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the bill will be laid over. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1406. House Bill 1406 by Representative Arnson and Moreno concerning the augmentation of the general fund through transfers of certain money. Senator Moreno. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1406 and the Appropriations Committee report. To the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Appropriations Committee, we adopted a couple of amendments to make a few more transfers from some different cash funds, all of which were considered by the Joint Budget Committee this is the bill that effectuates the cash fund transfers that were not unanimous uh, from the committee. Um, and so we incorporated a few others that were not unanimous. Ask for an vote. Is there any further discussion? The motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. Do your thing, Bob. Senator Rankin. To the bill. Right? Yep. To the bill. So, members, um, this bill came up, this idea came up in the Joint Budget Committee, but it is not a Joint Budget Committee no. bill. It is, in, in fact, focused toward uh, balancing the budget, but it incorporates a policy which some of us objected to and therefore asked that it become a separate bill. And that policy is to sweep cash funds. And these cash funds, there are actually two categories of cash funds that were discussed in the Joint Budget Committee. One of those categories of cash funds, the money originates from the general fund and is transferred into the cash fund for use as a specific purpose. The other category of cash funds, and there are a number of them listed in this bill, this category of cash funds originated from either, either fines or fees. So this is the classic example of converting a fee to a, to a tax because when money is transferred to the general fund, it gets used as taxes get used. So when you, when you went and got new tires, 
and you paid a fee for a waste disposal of tires, did you really intend that money to be used to pay for Medicaid? I don't think so. What, and the one, the amendment, which I didn't speak to specifically, transfers $5 million worth of money from the off-highway vehicle fund, and one that we got literally hundreds of emails on. So the folks who drive these off-highway vehicles pay a registration fee, and that money is used for various purposes to support that sport. So they were especially adamant that they did not want their fund, their money, which they viewed as their money for their sport to be used for the general fund. We got, I got hundreds of emails on that subject. So what we've done, what this bill does, is sort of wrap all those together and those that were amended in today. So when you paid your money for a waste uh, tire disposal, it's now general fund. And there's a whole series of these things, Petroleum Cleanup and Redevelopment Fund, paid for fees for folks who store petroleum products. That's now general fund money, $2.7 million. Uh, so on and on. Now, historically, this was done before. In 08, fortunately, there was a lot of, there was a lot of severance taxes. We didn't transfer a lot of severance taxes this time because there aren't any. You know, there just aren't any in the cash funds for the mineral impact fund. So, but historic, historically, we did transfer. And the one that people still complain about was the brand board that was transferred in 08. So my, our objection to this is just bad policy. We should not be using money that was collected as fees for a specific purpose, as registration fees or fines and penalties, should not become a tax. We clearly are converting fees to a tax. It's bad policy. So I urge a no vote. Is there any further discussion? We're going to clean off the microphone here. Senator Marino. Thank you, Madam Chair. And colleagues, um, in prior recessions, cash fund transfers have, been have become fairly common as a way to balance the budget. Now, this is a one-time mechanism because a lot of these cash fund transfers develop a balance over a number of years. And so this isn't going to be a mechanism that will be available to balance the budget in the future. However, it's become, it's become common because that's what happens when 30% of your budget is based on fees. This is what happens when we have a state government that is starved of revenue. And so we have to figure out a way to still pay for the operations of state government and we turn to fees. We become a fees-based state government. So it's not surprising, colleagues, when the state falls on hard times we have to transfer some of this money because that's what we've become because we have not had a conversation on the proper amount of revenue to support state operations. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1406. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and 1406 is adopted. Will a clerk please read House Bill, the title to House Bill 1419. House Bill 1419 by Representatives Escar and Landgraf, Senators Moreno and Quorum concerning the creation of cash funding in which money received from pharmaceutical rebates for the state drug assistance program administered by the Department of Public Health and Environment will be credited. Senator Moreno. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1419. Is there any discussion on House Bill 1419? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1419. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1419 is adopted. Mr. Carpenter, will you please read the title of the House Bill 1423? 
Bill 1423 by Representative Stipper Neville, Senator Woodward and Zinzinger, concerning the one-year suspension of a scheduled pay increase for members of the Colorado General Assembly and in connection with reducing an appropriation. Senator Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1423 in the appropriations report. I don't think there is uh, Senator Woodward, I don't think there's an appropriations well, report. And there is no report, so that was quick and easy. I move House Bill 1423. Move the bill. Senator... Me? Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In 2015, the legislature enacted legislation that would increase the base pay for any legislator elected beginning in 2019. So in January 1st of 2019, every House member and half of the Senate received a salary of 2,242. Beginning this coming January 1st, every House member and half the Senate is scheduled to get a salary increase to 41,141. We are all aware that the people of Colorado are facing significant financial struggles as a result of the shutdown. When my constituents heard that the legislator was getting a raise, they were livid. My email lighted up with complaints. This bill suspends that pay raise and freezes every legislator at 40242 for one year. We should not be getting raises while the people of Colorado face such a struggle. It is only appropriate that we share in their plight. Further discussion? Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What we're talking about here is a cost of living adjustment that was prearranged in a bill that was voted on back in 2015. What this bill does is it would take the current senators that are at 40,000. 242. 242 and freeze them there. It would take the group of senators that are slated to increase to 41, 141, back down to 40, 242. And we ask for your I vote. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Proud to rise in support of House Bill 1423. As I explained on the legislative appropriation bill, it did include the money required to pay for this salary increase for half of this chamber and 65 people across the way. And the reason the legislative appropriation bill included those money is, monies, those dollars, is the current law required it to. With this bill, House Bill 1423, we're changing the law, which allows that number to come down. We couldn't do this change in the legislative appropriation bill. We had to follow the law. With this bill, and thank you to uh, Speaker Becker and my, uh, Majority Leader Garnett for approving this late bill and bringing it out of the House. Thank you to the House members who all would see this raise if we don't do this bill. Thank you for bringing it over to the Senate and thank you to, uh, to the bill sponsors for bringing House Bill 1423. This is a rare bill because it has a, a negative appropriation. If and when this bill becomes law, it will actually decrease the legislative appropriation, which then decreases the legislative appropriation bill, what we've already approved. And this is really the only way we could do it. I wish we would have seen this before the COVID-19 uh, adjournment that we had. I wish we could have recognized this earlier. We didn't, but when we came back uh, into session after that long adjournment, this stuck out like a sore thumb because all of those 3.3 or so billion dollars that we heard on school finance and other uh, uh, legislation that we've considered, it became blatantly obvious in our legislative appropriation bill. I want to give out another shout out to all the agency directors, Legislative Council, Legislative Legal Services, State Auditor, and JBC. Thank you so much for trimming back your budgets and dealing with this hard time. And thank you to the bill sponsors for running this bill. Ask for an I vote so we can all share in doing what's right by the people of Colorado. Ask for an I vote on 1423. Senator Zenzinger. I neglected to point out that all of the legislators that were elected in 2018 received this increase. 
So that includes about half of this Senate chamber. The other half of the Senate chamber is at the old salary level, which is 30,000. That will not change with this bill. Everybody will be, for the first time in five years, at the same salary level. I ask for an I vote. Senator Winter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, just as in the last bill, I will be a reluctant yes vote on this bill um, because I stand with our schools that are in heart. I stand with our businesses and our state employees. However, again, I believe that democracy works best when we have a diversity of ideas, when we have a diversity of backgrounds. And unfortunately, the way we have this job set up to work for a very long time, very long hours, for four months, doesn't exactly make it accessible. And when we are making laws about frontline workers, and it's next to impossible for a frontline worker to have a seat in this chamber, when it is next to impossible for a waitress to have a seat in this chamber, when it is next to impossible for a single mom to have a seat in this chamber, we are overrepresented by folks that are retired. We're overrepresented by folks that do things like real estate part-time or, or being lawyers part-time. And we're not going to truly have ideas represented in this chamber and get those ideas in this chamber because that's how we make the best laws until we fix the system of really truly having a citizen legislature which has to involve a discussion on legislative pay. Is there further discussion on House Bill 1423? Seeing none, the question before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1423. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the bill is adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I request a senatorial five. We will be in a senatorial five.
Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we proceed out of order to take up House Bill 1332. The motion before the body is to proceed out of order in order to take up House Bill 1332. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and we will proceed out of order. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1332. House Bill 1332 by Representative Herod and Jackson Center Field concerning prohibitions on discrimination in housing based on source of income in connection with making an appropriation. Senator Fields. Madam Chair, I'd like to renew my motion to move House Bill 1332. I believe we have already adopted the report, so to the bill. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Members, while we were on recess, I had the opportunity to meet with stakeholders, and uh, we have come to an agreement, and so I believe there's a, an amendment at the desk. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L017? Amendment L017, House Bill 1332. Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Basically, this amendment addresses some of the concerns we heard earlier from my um, colleague from Fort Collins in reference to why do we need to have a point of advertising in post and in, in advertising and um, what's the word and in posting information for units that are five and less. So basically, what this amendment does, and I move L017, it strikes that um, requirement for um, anyone that has uh, five uh, rental units um, under five. So I ask for an I vote on L017. Senator Priola. Thanks, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I vetted this amendment with Senator Fields. Um, it, it's good, it gets us back to the basis of the simple five or more that the uh, realtors are fine with. It, it improves the bill and I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of Amendment L017. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. To the bill, Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Members, um, source of income has become a discrimination factor and a barrier against people receiving adequate housing that's safe and secure. What is happening is if you are someone that's on Social Security, let's say you're someone on disability uh, income, let's say you're a veteran, let's say that um, you have other federal disabilities or pension security, social security, those are all considered fixed income. And a lot of time when you try to rent housing and you have that source of income that is used to deny you and to reject the opportunity for you to obtain housing. There was a survey that was done that indicated that 47% of renters try to rent housing, they were rejected because they have veterans benefits. They were rejected because they're on Social Security. They were rejected because they have a pension or other federal disabilities. This would um, ensure that you can't discriminate against someone because of their type of income. Let's say that you're unemployed and you're receiving unemployment benefits. We know that everybody doesn't live on easy street. Some people may not be working for huge corporations, and they may be a senior who's on fixed income, Social Security. They should have access to secure, quality, safe housing. So I urge an I vote on House Bill 1332. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1332. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. The ayes have it, and the bill is adopted. We will take another bazillion minute senatorial five.
Senate will come back to order for the Committee of the Whole. Ever we are in at this point in the evening. Um, Mr. Carpenter, will you please read the title of the House Bill 1410? House Bill 1410 by Representative Gonzalez Gutierrez and Exum, Senators Gonzalez and Zenzinger. Concerning assistance for individuals facing housing related hardship due to the COVID 19 pandemic and in connection therewith, transferring money received from the federal government pursuant to the CARES Act to the Eviction Legal Defense Fund and the Housing Development Grant Fund to provide such assistance and make an appropriation. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we move second bill on, we move House Bill 1410, funding for COVID 19 emergency housing assistance, on second reading and ask for an I vote. Is there further discussion? Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to over 450,000 claims for unemployment insurance benefits across the state of Colorado, with others experiencing a significant decline in their household incomes. As a result, hundreds of thousands of Coloradans are facing a serious threat to their housing security, both renters and homeowners. While Governor Polis has issued executive orders limiting evictions and foreclosures, once those orders are lifted, as soon as Saturday, June 13th, there will be a significant number of Coloradans who are on the brink of foreclosure, eviction, and homelessness. Bless you. According to the Neighborhood Development Collaborative, it is estimated 
that 91,912 cost-burdened Colorado renters will be in need of housing cost assistance at the end of the statewide eviction moratorium. Providing one month of assistance at $1,200 would indicate a need of $98,294,000 to keep these families housed. 31,516 cost burden homeowners will be in need of assistance after the statewide foreclosure moratorium. Providing a month of assistance to them at $1,500 a month for that one month would indicate a need of $47,273,000 to keep those families housed. Let me say those numbers again. We're looking at close to $150 million in need for one month of assistance. House Bill 1410 is a step. It allocates $20 million in coronavirus relief funds for emergency housing assistance for the Coloradans experiencing a financial need as a result of COVID. Let's talk about it. Of that $20 million, the bulk, $19,650,000, is directed to the Housing Development Grant Fund within the Department of Local Affairs. What are we going to do with that money? It's going to go to residential mortgage and rental assistance. Let's be clear. Tenants will be able to access, access these desperately needed dollars. And so will homeowners. And don't worry, so will landlords. Landlords and nonprofit lenders will be eligible for assistance under House Bill 1410 in order to keep their tenants and the mortgagers housed and as a result, fulfill their debt obligations. We hope and intend that House Bill 1410 would assist 14,600 families to maintain their housing security. After that, $350,000 of the $20 million in coronavirus relief funds will be directed to the Eviction Legal Defense Fund in order to assist indigent renters who are facing eviction, an impending eviction, or other housing-related legal matters. Why does that matter? Because we know that expanding the availability of legal aid will help Coloradans, will help Colorado tenants to negotiate repayment plans and just have a little bit more time to relocate, which when you think about it, is kind of important during a global pandemic. Investing in eviction legal aid 
will save taxpayer money because we know that the driving factor in homelessness is eviction. And so this will save taxpayer money because we won't have as many people in shelters. Because we won't have as many people in hospital beds. Because we know when people become homeless, that exacerbates their mental health and well-being, that destabilizes not only the parent, but the entire family. And so saving those taxpayer dollars are all worthy goals when a time when our public resources are scarce. There are a number of organizations that support this worthy legislation. Let's start with the Colorado Association of Realtors, Housing Colorado, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, Colorado Center on Law and Policy, the Neighborhood Development Collaborative, Associated Centers for Independent Living, Enterprise Community Partners, Maker Housing Partners, the Colorado Organization for Latina Opportunity and Reproductive Rights, also known as COLOR, the Rocky Mountain Home Association, Habitat for Humanity, Mile High United Way, and 9 to 5 Colorado. Interestingly enough, even on this bill, even on this critical legislation, the Apartment Association of Colorado has clocked in on as neutral. Let that sink in. There is an am oh. Thank you. There is an immense need for rental assistance. My community, Denver, the city and county of Denver has stepped up. Many communities across the state have stepped up. And we also know that expanding the availability of legal aid can help to meet the needs that cannot be covered by rental assistance. And we also know that right now, even during a moratorium, your constituents, my constituents, the people of Colorado, they need help. They need help navigating their repayment plans. They need help dealing with illegal lockouts. They need support so that their landlords don't shut off their utilities. In the midst of this pandemic, these landlords 
have retaliated in some cases. So there are Coloradans who need a lawyer. And in a moment of crisis, this bill will help them access one. Let us not forget that investment of $350,000 will yield a considerable return on investment. A few hours of an attorney's time can help prevent a family from experiencing weeks or even months of homelessness. So it's a good investment. That investment in legal aid to prevent evictions will save taxpayers money. And it's already proven to be extraordinarily valuable. But let's take a further look. In Colorado, there is less than one legal aid attorney available currently, right now. Less than one legal aid attorney for every 30,000 people experiencing poverty. That ranks us among the bottom five states in the country, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Investing in this worthy program will help families get on their feet and remains, remain housed as our state endeavors to recover from this financial crisis. And let's not forget that this financial crisis was spurred by this global pandemic. Well, where are we gonna come up with this money, you might ask? So let's talk about the reach and the scope. The Housing Development Grant Fund is an existing line item within the Division of Housing, and it's had a long and successful track record of getting communities the resources they need as it pertains to housing. There are a number of agencies across the state that the Division of Housing has funded for emergency rental and mortgage assistance. Statewide, there's two organizations, the Salvation Army serves communities across the state Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And Brothers Redevelopment serves communities across the state weekdays, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Here in the Front Range, in Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, and Boulder County, Jewish Family Service supports people. Family Tree serves communities in Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, Broomfield, and Boulder. Volunteers of America does their part. The Action Center does their part. Almost Home Incorporated, Neighbor to Neighbor, Homeward Alliance, Heart in Home at Family Promise of Colorado Springs. The, sh the Safe Shelter of St. Vrain Valley serves Boulder and Weld County individuals who are fleeing domestic violence or elder abuse. 
I failed to mention that the heart and home at Family Promise of Colorado Springs, which serves communities in El Paso and Teller County, serves families with minor children. Expectant mothers who are in their third trimester and families with disabled adult children where the parent or guardian is the caregiver. Mount, Mount Carmel Veterans Service Center serves military veterans and their family members. The Pinon Project Family Resource Center serves Montezuma and Dolores counties, Centennial Mental Health Center, serves Cheyenne, Albert, Kit Carson, Lincoln, Logan, Morgan, Phillips, Sedgwick, Washington, and Yuma counties, Catholic Charities, serves Eagle, Pitkin, and Garfield counties, Grand Valley Catholic Outreach, serves Mesa County. Sorry. La Puente Home serves communities in, in, uh, in the valley, Alamosa, Rio Grande, Sawatch, Conejos, Costilla, Mineral County. And Housing Solutions for the Southwest serves La Plata, San Juan, and Archuleta counties. In addition to those agencies that I've talked you through that serve the general public, the Division of Housing has also contracted with Habitat, of Human for, Habitat for Humanity of Colorado to work specifically with the low-income homeowners who reside in Habitat homes. And also are working with the Colorado chapter of NAHRO to work specifically with public housing authorities to provide emergency rental assistance. I want to just go back again. Eighty one thousand cost burden renters in the state of Colorado. 31,000 cost burden homeowners, $150 million of need, House Bill 1410 says we're going to step up and we're going to do our part. Here's $20 million. A few times now, I've heard some of my colleagues across the aisle ask questions about process. Well, I've never been in the middle of a global pandemic, but every day, pri prior to now, I guess, but every day that we were on our stay at home orders, I was on the phone with constituents, with community, with city council members, My local school board member, who is also a well-known pastor in our community, because he was no longer able to offer preschool, given the social distancing orders, he instead worked with our local city councilwoman to set up a mask-making shop. So this whole process has been weird. And while this bill 
has been put together in a pretty short amount of time. Given the unusual circumstances, we've done our due diligence to reach out to stakeholders within the housing advocacy community. We've tried to talk to anyone who would listen. We talked to affordable housing advocates, the realtors, the Almighty Apartment Association. We talked to mobile, park home, mobile home park owners. We talked to bankers, the Division of Housing, and tenants themselves. We're proud to say that no one to date has come out in opposition to this bill and that the industry trade groups are either in a support or a neutral position. This bill is a product that was modified in response to their feedback. The first draft only included assistance for renters. But we took that feedback that we received and expanded access to that $20 million to include homeowners and, yes, landlords. We did that because we know that landlords may be in a good position to receive assistance on behalf of a large number of tenants, and two, because we wanted to ensure that we could protect a vulnerable, not number, a vulnerable generation of home buyers and their assets. We drafted the bill knowing the precious limited dollars that we had to utilize, and we drafted our bill 1410 to prioritize and to assist those who have been impacted most by this pandemic and its adverse effects. The populations listed out under renter assistance, such as disabled or homeless veterans, domestic violence survivors, low and moderate income renters and the others who are historically the most impacted during times of economic distress. On the mortgage assistance side, we took the lessons that we learned from the Great Recession and we reflected those, lang that, those lessons in the language of this bill. During that time, assistance for low and moderate income homeowners was late to the game. We learned that in 2008. And consequently, just over a decade ago, we lost nearly an entire generation of low and moderate income homeowners, many of them people of color, many of them first time home buyers. And so 1410 is crafted 
intentionally to make sure that these people are able to protect their hard-earned assets and to continue to live in their communities. And yet we have to ask ourselves, if we have $20 million to provide out of a $150 million need, what do we do? Over the past month, I hope, like each and every one of you, I've woken up in the middle of the night wondering, what's going to happen to our people? I am by nature someone who wants to fix things. I am by nature someone who, when I see someone in crisis, I want to do work to solve, not just through Band-Aids, I want to solve the root cause of that which is causing them harm. So I got to work. How do we keep people in a moment in which we know that we are safest at home, in a moment in which our governor is telling us to stay at home, where do you go if you don't have a home? During the crisis, when we were not here at the Capitol, The homeless shelters in my community, in the heart of Denver, were not able to abide by social distancing guidelines because those churches, those shelters, are built to cram as many human bodies in as possible. to give people a roof over their heads on a cold night. And so instead, we said, what about the National Western Center? Maybe we can create, maintain social distancing there. And maybe we can keep people housed, if not housed, at least sheltered, while not exposing them to the virus. We started begging our governor for assistance. First, to deploy the National Guard, and later to put forward an eviction on moratoriums. It took him a while, but I'm glad he finally acted. He put forward an eviction moratorium that'll expire this Saturday, June the 13th.
over the course of the next several weeks, we all, everyone, all the stakeholders met incessantly trying to find a compromise. How do we move forward when we know that the scale of the problem in front of us is three times what we experienced during the Great Recession? What ultimately resulted in House Bill 1410 was a piece of those conversations. It was a step. But the funny thing is, if you're a renter, there's always another month's rent to pay. If you're the homeowner, there's always the mortgage to pay. If you're the mortgage company, there's always the whoever it is that you have to pay, and so on and so forth. So the pressure really comes down to the tenant. The tenant's got to pay their bills. The tenant's got to pay their bills so that we can keep this whole financial system in check. What would it look like for us to imagine a world in which we could treat each other with a little grace? Where we could say, you know what? We get it. How could we protect small business owners who had rent obligations? How could we protect residential tenants who had to pay their rent? How could we protect the landlords to make sure they are made whole? How could we actually ensure that the eviction process is fair? Had a lot of policy conversations about that. We're not breaking any new ground here in Colorado. Red and blue states across this country have already gone much further than we have. Already, even prior to the pandemic, states have better protections and a more fair process in their eviction courts. Now during the pandemic, red and blue states across the country are prohibited from filing an eviction notice during the, uh, the pendency of the pandemic. I worked on policy to allow landlords to file an eviction notice and at the same time protect tenants who could show a financial hardship 
directly related to the pandemic. When I say hardship directly related to the pandemic, I mean they lost their job. I mean maybe they were in the ICU. I mean maybe they were hooked up to a ventilator. When I talk about a COVID-related hardship, I say, in the instances in which their spouse or their child died, maybe we could show them a little grace and give them some time until they pay back their rent. Maybe they'd filed for unemployment. And I'm sure each and every one of us in this room fielded calls from our constituents frantic because they were trying to do what we had asked of them. But when, you when a system receives half a million unemployment claims over the course of two months, sometimes it takes them a little while for their claims to get processed. We asked the landlords to provide notice. I should say we would have asked landlords to provide notice. So that their tenants knew that if they had a COVID related hardship, that there would be some grace for them. So that when they're in the eviction courts, that they could demonstrate affirmatively to a judge through written or electronic documentation that they lost their job, that they'd applied and hadn't yet received their unemployment benefits, that they had been diagnosed, that they had been quarantined, that they had lost a loved one. to the pandemic, that maybe their roommate died because they had gotten sick. Cancer wouldn't be a qualifying hardship for this eviction relief. Only COVID. We also asked, we also would have asked the landlords to not extend late fees. Oh, but the landlord lobby is strong in this state.
Turns out we can't extend grace in this state because we can't rewrite contracts. But what I heard time and time and time and time again was that the, land, the landlords who I knew, the landlords who were reaching out, the landlords who knew the right thing, did the right thing. They offered up repayment plans. Some of them said, hey, I got a mortgage too. I'm charging you X, but my mortgage is only Y. So how about you pay me the lesser of the two balance and we'll call it good. Other landlords said, I'll just forgive this rent payment for this month to help you get back on your feet. Still others said, let's break this payment plan into something that can we can work out over the course of the next several months. You pay it in installments. Some people said, some landlords said, I will I'll use your last month's rent in your security deposit. We know that we can't rewrite contracts, but we also know that we can appeal to the goodness because the vast majority, the goodness in people, the goodness in Coloradans because the vast majority of Colorado tenants pay their rents on time, even in the midst of a, of a pandemic, and the vast majority of Colorado landlords are good people. So we worked on policy. We even walked through language to ensure that the Department of Local Affairs would put together uh, flyers to make sure that people in the respective communities knew exactly where to turn for help. if they could demonstrate that COVID-related hardship. Why does this matter now? Colorado, prior to the pandemic, enjoyed one of the strongest economies, if not the strongest economy in the country. Our unemployment rate was one of the lowest in the country. And yet, in January and February, we were at a 2.5% unemployment rate. And at the end of April, it had more than quadrupled.
upwards of 350,000 families. Renters are at risk of eviction by September 2020. The average rent here in the state of Colorado is $1,340. And so what I've often heard is why don't we get people back to work? Why, that's the solution. And yet for too many people, there's no job for them to return to. Weld County has 16,200 people at risk of eviction by September. Boulder County has 20,700 eviction risk, uh, people uh, at risk of eviction by September. Larimer County has 26,400 people at risk of eviction in September of this year. Jefferson County has 27,000 people, 27,500 people. Adams County has 28,600 people at risk. El Paso County has 37,300 people at risk of eviction. Not in some far off wonderland in 90 days. Arapahoe County has 40,600 people at risk of eviction. In my district, in Denver County, 61,300 people are at risk of being evicted in the next 90 days. We wanted to protect people from retaliation. Because what we saw in the midst of the pandemic prior to the placement of the eviction moratorium, which will expire this Saturday, we heard the tactics that these unscrupulous renters, I'm sorry, these unscrupulous landlords, the narrow minority, were utilizing. NPR National covered uh, this issue. Carlos Bott from Longmont, Colorado said, my landlord called me about 20 times a day from eight in the morning to nine at night. He asked for permission to get a roommate, to help pay the monthly $15.95 a month rent and says his landlord got very angry 
and started pressuring him to move out. Bot and his wife, they co-signed the lease on their duplex in Longmont. The kids are U.S. citizens, but his wife isn't a citizen. And so his landlord accused him of misrepresenting himself on the lease. Mr. Bott is a software engineer. And so when the pandemic hit, he moved his office home under the shelter in place orders. And his landlord reminded him that working from home is a violation of the lease, which does not allow for home-based businesses. It didn't matter much though, because Bot pretty quickly thereafter lost his job. So when Bot expressed to his landlord, concerned about finding another place to rent, he says that his landlord suggested he just sleep in his car. He says that what's most shocking to him is that he thought that renting from a mom and pop landlord would give him more protection, but that hasn't been the case. He found a place to move out to and a room to rent through May. And then he was going to be homeless after that. The NPR story ends with him asking the question, who's going to want to rent to an unemployed man? There are a number of people in this state who are vulnerable immediately upon expiration of this moratorium. Thirty eight percent of renters are vulnerable as soon as that moratorium expires. There's another group of people who will become vulnerable once the federal unemployment insurance benefits run out. And then there will, the third group will become vulnerable once their savings and their credit cards max out. The National Apartment Association is calling for federal intervention. And so yet, they oppose the state taking any type of action to extend this moratorium. Prior to the pandemic, here's what we know to be true about evictions. Evictions can lead to prolonged joblessness, negative health outcomes, decreased school attendance for children, and homelessness.
That is the question before us. Yesterday, a national story broke. USA Today. Evictions expected to spike as states end moratoriums that offered relief during COVID-19. I could read you the whole article, but you should already know the story. A person who had been working hard, a person who had been paying their rent on time, When the pandemic hit, they stayed at home. They were asked to stay at home. The businesses closed. They applied for unemployment. The unemployment check hadn't come in. The rent was due. And now what? Across the country, 24 states are processing evictions again. And Colorado will be one of 30 states that that number will climb to, one of six other states that will join those other 24 by the end of this month. Tens of millions of workers across this country are unemployed and the economy is likely to remain shaky at best until there's a vaccine and until consumers feel safe enough to travel, to dine out, and to go to the theme parks and to the movies again. Diane Yentl, the president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, said, quote, back rent is coming due and renters are no more able to pay it now than they were at the beginning of the crisis. We are very concerned about a wave of evictions and a spike in homelessness, unless there's some sort of federal intervention. Yentl points to the HEROES Act, which calls for $100 billion in emergency rental assistance as the best solution. saying that the money is needed to keep people in their homes and to keep landlords from losing their investments.
The $3 trillion bill, which passed the House of Representatives last month, is unlikely to win approval in the U.S. Senate. And so things could get a lot worse when the federal moratorium on evictions expires at the end of July. Since the 1960s, rental costs have spiked 61%, while the wages of renters have stagnated, increasing by only 5%. Renters pay a greater share of their income for shelter which puts them in an increasingly precarious position. And they're not able to save for a rainy day. Elisa Durana, who studies evictions with Princeton University's eviction lab, She stated that before the pandemic, there was one eviction every seven minutes, 300,000 every month. There were more evictions annually than there were foreclosures at the height of the Great Recession. And so House Bill 1410 is our attempt to do our part, to sign up and to play our role in trying to overcome this crisis. I worked pretty incessantly over the course of the stay-at-home order. I held meetings with stakeholders. I talked to my colleagues. I talked to organizations in my district who were supporting their tenant, who were supporting renters, and tried to move forward a policy. But I couldn't get the votes because the landlord lobby in this building, in this building, is strong. We abandoned the bill. We started working through a compromise. And then realized that the amendment that we were being asked to carry wasn't a compromise at all. It's, the, it's akin to the story of the Longmont man who at the midst, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of having lost his job, in the midst of trying to figure it out, in the midst of waiting for, land, for his unemployment insurance to come through, his landlord was calling 20 times a day 
demanding to get paid. On Monday, when we all start getting calls. Will you just take the senatorial five? Would you do that? I request a senatorial five. There's been a the request for a senatorial five is granted.
All right, we've got the AV system back on. Thank you. Senator Zenzinger. I move House Bill 1410 and ask for an I vote. You've heard the motion. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1410? Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the passage of House Bill 1410. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. 1410 is adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee to rise and report. The motion before the body is to rise and report. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. We will rise and report. Well, hello, sir. Thank you, Chris. So Senate will come to order. Senator Hansen. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has met and had a number of bills under consideration. Will the clerk please read the report? Mr. President, your committee holds the report setting service and following test bills, being severed in the open, makes final recommendations are on. House Bill 1415 is been House Bill 1213 is been House Bill 1421, House Bill 1197, House Bill 1406 is been House Bill 1419, House Bill 1423, House Bill 1332 is been House Bill 1410 passed. Second bill revised. Please count up for the ring of final passage. Senator Hansen. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption of the report. Motion is for the adoption of the committee of the whole report. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read? <laughs> amendment 001 to the committee of the whole report. Committee of the whole amendment 001. Mr. Sonberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, committee of the whole report uh, amendment one. And to the amendment. Members, this is something that I failed to put on during committee. Uh, it is actually a technical amendment that allows uh, for a couple of other places with the amendment regarding the small volume commodity handlers that was in the uh, committee report. Uh, since I was inept and did a terrible job and my good friend helped me get things fixed back up, I ask for your I vote to, to correct my screw up. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Senator. I don't disagree with my colleague. He screwed up. The question before the body is the adoption amendment 001 of the committee of the whole report. Are there any no votes? With 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, zero excuse, the committee of the whole report is adopted. Excuse me, the amendment 001 is adopted. The question, the question before the body is the adoption of the committee of the whole report. Are there any no votes? With 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent, and zero excuse, the committee of the whole report is adopted. House Bill 1450 as amended, House Bill 1213 as amended, House Bill 1421, House Bill 1197. House Bill 1406 is amended, House Bill 1419, House Bill 1423, House Bill 1332 is amended, House Bill 1410. Pass on second reading order, revise the place on the calendar for third reading and final passage.
Oh, it's all on me. <laughs> I think you need more than me. You can just sign. You can just sign. Thank you. Of course. I'm feeling sad. Yes, sir. They called everybody. <laughs> Announcements. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, to lay over the balance of the calendar until tomorrow, June 12th. The motion is to lay over the balance of the calendar until 6-12-2020. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the balance of the calendar will be laid over until 6-12-2020. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, we are now going to move on to the other seven tributes for the outgoing members. Nobody thought that was funny. Wake up. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the Senate adjourn until tomorrow, June 12th at 9 a.m. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. And the Senate will stand in adjournment until 6 12 2020 at 0900 hours.